This is another Toastmasters District 96 Plan B workshop. Why are you only reaching for the moon? In this workshop, Winston invites you to come and hear why he feels you are only limiting yourself by shooting for the moon. I invite you to make people believe because the belief when they go, yeah, I can do that, that sticks. As we get started, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Hit the notification bell and add comments. Tell us what kind of content you would like to see on our channel as we go forward. He is a creator. He creates change. He is the founder of the Voice Story Foundation, a nonprofit organization that is addressing the issue of social isolation by creating social connection, facilitating personal healing, and promoting community building to develop an individual's ability to embrace and share their unique stories. Please give Winston a warm welcome. It's beautiful that everyone's muted. <laughs> Thank you everyone for taking time out of this beautiful Sunday to uh, listen to me. And over the next little while that we are together, I ask that you just uh, put aside your devices, be present and join me for a journey. So, when I heard of, when, when I was invited to speak at this Toastmaster event and saw that the theme was shoot for the moon, it's your time to shine. The very first thing that came to my mind is why are you only aiming for the moon? And I can only say that now because I used to aim for the moon. I used to aim for these targets of how I thought I wanted my life to be. And from that, I had a baseline to really see where, where I have come. And over the next 30, 40 minutes, I will weave a tail and invite you to come along for the ride. So before we begin, I would like to play a little short clip from one of my speakers to help frame the space that we're going to be entering into. His name is Tian Neo Imas, and he is speaking about curiosity. Now, as a race, as a racialized person, as a person of color, and now as a trans person, um, I'm very used to how people look at me. And I'm used now to how people, through the years of my gender stuff, in the years of being what we call the ugly ducking phase, where you're not really sure what people are, I'm used to how people read me and the isolation that happens when we aren't being with soul in front of us because we are not being curious about who is there behind those eyes. Or am I just gonna assume brown woman must mean something, right? You know, white guy oh, must mean something. And we come in with all our point of views and all our perspectives and we never get to know who is sitting right there in front of me. Now when we can add gender into this picture, white man, not just white, now you're a man. Now I've decided a whole world about you. And then I talk to that person as though I already know who you are and I never ever let you tell me who you are. When we're curious, I suddenly got to know you, which is beautiful because that's being connected. So with that, I invite you to be curious and to listen and see where that takes us over the next little while. So to give you a bit of background on me, I grew up in Vancouver, raised by my grandparents, so a very traditional upbringing. And then at the age of six, I was transplanted back to North Vancouver where my parents ran a corner store. And back in the 70s, it wasn't as culturally diverse as it is now. And what I learned from that harsh transition was I was different. And I also felt I didn't belong. So I did whatever I needed to do to do that. 
And then that started a narrative in my head. Next thing that happened being from this very culturally strict uh, background that my parents were in was they never praised their children. So you've all heard about the you're not good enough syndrome. Well, that was the space that I grew up in. And the story that I often tell is I ran home with a perfect mark on this algebra exam, ran to my mom, and I told her, look, I have a perfect mark. And she just looked at me and said, you could have done better. And I didn't understand. Like, I, I got 100%. I don't know how I could have done better. And she looked me in the eye and said, you didn't get the bonus question. So at that point, then I realized no matter what I did, it was never good enough. So I had to somehow do better. And that, those two elements combined and created this persona and this narrative in my head about who I was and what I was supposed to be, not what I wanted to be, what I was supposed to be in order to fit in and in order to be someone in this world. So that created this idea, this wonderful checklist that some of us have, some of us may not have, of what success looks like. What does accomplishing a goal and being praised and saying, you did good, Winston, what does that look like? Well, on my checklist, it was getting married, having two kids, having the house, the car, the career, all the toys, vacations, all this stuff, just to say that I belong, just to say that I fit in, fit into society, a society that I, at the beginning, said that I didn't belong. The narrative continued in my head for many, many years. And then it led to a point where I didn't know who I was, but everyone wanted to be associated with this persona I created. So I was living this life. Well, we'll fast forward to three years ago. I was courting this girl and I asked her if she wanted to join me for dinner. She had other plans and then later on said, you know what, if dinner's still on, I'd love to join you. So I, the place I wanted to take her didn't take reservations. So I arrived half an hour early just so I can get a table. While I was waiting, I decided to get a drink and I go, okay, it's going to be a little while. Well, half an hour passes, seven o'clock when we're supposed to meet up, no date. 7.15, no date. 7.30, no date. I'm like, okay, this is not going very well. And then I see a lady walk through the door. And what caught my eye wasn't that her hair blonde hair was in dreadlocks. It wasn't her sparkling blue eyes or the green tweed shirt that she was wearing, but it was this glow that came from her that I couldn't ignore. And I saw her walk by, check in, and then she sat down beside me. And every fiber in my being at that moment in time said, talk to her. And then I had my gut reaction that said, you can't talk to her, you're out of your mind. And then I heard it again and said, Talk to her. So I turned, said hello, and I was introduced to Feather. 7 30, 7 45, 8 o'clock, still no date, but it didn't really matter because I was engaged in conversation with my new friend. Eventually, my date showed up. I made introductions, I exchanged contact information with Feather, and we proceeded to have, I proceeded to have dinner with my date. A couple of days later, Feather reaches out to me to connect and we go on a stroll. Along this walk that we had, I look over and she caught my gaze and I felt this immense wave of shame and guilt for being caught looking. So she gently asks, what were you thinking? And I took in a breath and I felt another wave of guilt and shame come over me because I was never 
taught how to process my emotions, never mind to share my feelings. And I looked down, stared at my shoes, and just shuffled and just mumbled. It, it was nothing, really, nothing. So she smiled and asked again, so what were you thinking? And I took in a deep breath, and as terrified as I was, I felt safe in her space. So I said, I saw your eyes, I saw your smile, and I was just thinking to myself how beautiful you are. And then I held my breath, waiting for the world to end. And she just looked at me and said, thank you. So if you're speaking from a place of love and truth, why would you ever be afraid to share what you're thinking? And little did I know that would be the beginning of my awakening and she would be there to guide me for the next 10 weeks. Over the next 10 weeks, she showed me spaces that I never knew existed. And I asked question after question, so many questions as I'm trying to navigate this space of possibility of she inviting me into places that I go, this can't possibly be real because I was a very pragmatic person, very set in my ways. It's all about science. And if science can't explain it, then it can't be happening, but it's happening. So we had many walks along the seawall and during one was, she asked me this question, We're walking along English Bay. She just asked, Winston, what would your life be like what would your life be like if you let go of what you think your life should be like? And that stopped me dead in my tracks. And I said, could you please repeat what you said? She looked back, smiled and said, you heard me. And she kept on walking. And those words resonate, resonated in my mind and they still do too. They still do this day to this day. And it's been almost three years. And I never imagined that my life would be like this. Since that conversation, I teach storytelling. I have uh, my own live show. I broadcast on cable television, satellite TV. I mentor people, I speak to kids. I create change all from a conversation that I had with a stranger during a date. So you might be wondering, how did I get here? Well, November 26th, I was asked to present about speaking and storytelling to a female mastermind. So I arrive and then the two other people I was introduced to that were speaking, one was my competition, the second gentleman you may have, may have heard of, Sharuk Darwala. Uh, accomplished Toastmaster, and me. And I'm not going to lie to a screen full of Toastmasters that uh, I, you know, I have my own idea of what happens behind those closed doors at Toastmasters. You might you know, wonder how the purple Kool-Aid tastes, what flavor it is. But you know, I put that aside and we had, we had our time to share with this mastermind. Now, on the way out, I cross paths with Sharuk. And then I hear in my head, talk to him. And I'm going, what are you in, like, whatever. This guy's, we have nothing in common. And I heard it again, talk to him. And the only other time in my entire life I've ever heard that was when I met Feather. So I invited Sharuk to go chat, have a conversation over a cup of coffee. So we, as we walked down Denman Street to find a coffee shop, he's sharing how he became a Toastmaster, what he's achieved at being a Toastmaster. I'm sitting there going, that's pretty cool stuff, but who are you? So we sit down, and then he starts telling me about when he was growing up in Mumbai, his mom 
putting him into speaking competitions and how it groomed him into being who he was today. And I resonated with his story. I felt the passion in it and I invited him to speak on my stage. So he agreed and then a couple of weeks passed by and I receive an email from him that says, you should really apply to speak at this. And it was an invitation to speak, to apply to speak at the District 96th Annual Conference. And I looked at that and I go, whatever. And I, and I put it aside. 10 days later, I get a follow-up email, which says, I really hope that you apply to speak at this. And now I'm taken back because the first one might have been a jest. The second one, like he's actually taking time out of his day, suggesting that I speak to this. So I go to my team and I show them the email and I ask them flat out, what the hell could I possibly offer a group of Toastmasters? And the simple reply was, how, you do, how do you know that you aren't exactly what they need to hear? I'm like, okay. I, I can accept that. Because in my head, I had an idea of what a group of Toastmasters, what a room of Toastmasters would be like, how they would speak, how they would act, how they would think. And I realized that filter that I have, that narrative that I have in my head, is preventing me from taking advantage of this possibility, of this opportunity. And I have no idea how this is going to unfold. And it's unfolding in real time right now because I did apply. And then a few weeks later, I have five Toastmasters on a Zoom call deciding whether or not we would continue. And I speak to them and like going, yeah, okay, you know what, it's not, it's not getting past this stage. It gets past that stage. Okay, all right, now we have to prepare. Then COVID hits. It's canceled, great, we don't have to go through with this. Oh, we're gonna go through with it anyway. Everyone else is speaking, okay, then I'll speak too. And then uh, I'm, I'm not making this up, it was last Sunday, I get one that said, can you please update your information or check it please, Winston, because uh, you're, you'll be speaking on Sunday. I'm like, Sunday? Uh, a, a week, a week from now, uh, I'm like, okay. And here we are speaking about what could possibly be. So what could that be? What, what could happen when we get out of our own heads about what we think our lives should be like, about our preconceptions, the narratives that all of us listening, all of you listening right now have something a routine, a narrative that you created in the back of your mind about whatever. We'll just use the example about me. Could be, what the hell is he talking about? What do I have to learn? What benefit am I sitting here spending half an hour of my Sunday listening to the guy tell a story about a date and then meeting Sharuk? But it's this invitation to go and look at yourselves and say, if I'm standing here in my own comfort zone, I stay within the space and I play within the rules that I created off of what? What is happening? What am I filtering out? What is not happening? What am I missing out on? The first one, when I met Feather, if I just go, no, I'm not talking or forget it. The fear of rejection is insurmountable. But I followed the guidance of the voice and it changed my life. The second one, I'm not talking to a Toastmaster, forget it. Not happening. He's aligned with my competition. Equally forget it, not gonna happen. Probably the most wonderful conversation that I had all of last year. By accepting the invitation of what could possibly be, what could happen? We, we sit here and think, I can't do this because, but what is that based on? If you go far enough back and you ask yourself, where did this belief come from? You might find an interesting answer and the most interesting of them all 
is there's nothing there at all, and you made it all up. I'll give you an example of that. I was at Cyprus. It was a beautiful Saturday morning, three feet of fresh powder, I get to the top, and there's 100 people waiting at the bottom to get on a chairlift. So I come down, I make eye contact with one person out of the 100, and I say, hey, do you want to pair up so we don't have to wait in line as long? We get together on the chairlift, he asks me how my day's going. I say, I wish they would open sky chair. I want one run down the fresh powder and I could be happy. I could go home happy. He said, why don't you hike? Uh, because it's gonna take like half an hour. And the minute those words left my lips, I realized I've never hiked it. So how could I possibly know it's gonna take half an hour? And he, he looks at me and goes, half an hour? How slow of a walker are you? I go, how long does it take? He goes, seven minutes, 10 if you're really out of shape. So I follow him up. As I stand there in front of the opening to this run, I realize that that belief that I had in my head that I created because I'd never done it, and I don't even know where that number came from, prevented me from doing this for the past decade. And then I proceeded to have the run that I've dreamed of having all day. But if I didn't question that thought, to this day, I would never hike that. So again, where did these stories come from? Where are these narratives that then grow over time? And then you will then sprinkle extra evidence of things that happen or not happen to reinforce what you think life should be. But if you stop that and put that aside, and accept the invitation that comes in. And the invitation might be, if you recalibrate how your body feels, Instead of saying, oh, that feels good, I'll go do that, to that really doesn't feel very comfortable, and I'm supposed to go do that instead. What would happen? Because if you really think about it, that feels good is comfort. That feels not so good if you kind of, I'm not going to say go jump off the deep end and go do everything that scares the crap out of you but if you go there and just dip your toe into that space that's outside of your comfort zone and go i'm gonna say yes to this opportunity i'm gonna walk through my illusions what i created and say i'm gonna go do this what stories could unfold what opportunities and experiences lay just over there so the first two examples that i've given you are of invitations that are coming in to me. I'll give you an example of an invitation that's presented, that I present out to someone. So at a meetup that my friend put on, uh, I, you know, I support his uh, initiatives, so I showed up, didn't know anyone but him, sat down at, at the big long table, and this gentleman sat down beside me, and I just looked at him and said, so uh, hey, why are you here? What are you all about? And he begins to tell me his story. And it was a beautiful story. Uh, it was a story about infertility. And I, th and I thought that was really cool, considering I've never heard about infertility, infertility from male perspective. So I asked him, would you be interested in sharing that live? I'd love to spread your message. I would love to take what you just shared with me and put it out there because I think other people need to hear it. Now, I opened the door. I opened the door of possibility to him of what could be, but he also has to go look at it as, and, I under, and I'm pretty sure I know the, the narratives. Are you freaking crazy? I can share that with you. I'm not gonna share that with a group of people. Who's gonna listen to that? What does, what? Do, my story has no meaning. Who, who cares about that? All of these obstacles put in the way. What could happen? 
if you knocked all of them down and you said yes, if you got rid of your standard operating procedure of no, 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 and just said yes and go, you know what, I'm going to go do it. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to go do it. Gloom and doom, you're painting gloom and doom, I'm still going to go do it because I painted the doom and gloom. What could possibly happen? Well, he took the stage, shared, and had tremendous feedback about other men coming up and saying, wow, I thought I was the only one. I didn't know there was someone else out there that had the same struggles. That connection to understand that you are no longer alone is life-changing. But not only that, he understood the power of his voice. He embraced his own story. He presented it. And then that shifts you when you realize, you know what? I like how I feel when I share this story. I like watching other people smile and cry and laugh. I resonate with people when they come up and say, thank you. I really needed to hear that. So in essence, what would happen if he said no? His life carries on. Opportunity is presented to us. We go, you know what? Not interested. We carry on. Life will continue giving them to us. We just have to be aware enough to see. So how would I put that in Toastmasteries for you? All of you are accomplished Toastmasters. I, I, I sit there supporting my friends who are Toastmasters, and I give you guys credit for doing what you do. But the Toastmasters that I have worked with, I ask them, you shared with me your story. This is what you want to present. So I'm going to ask you a simple question. What would that story be if you remove the judges, the timers, the training, the structure? What would that story be like? What would you share that you filtered completely out? If you put more of you into that story, what would that story sound like? What would that story feel like? How would you present yourself as you, not to be judged, but just you? What would that be like? When I saw them take that suit off, Toastmaster suit off, and then allow themselves to be in that moment of discomfort, to show themselves, to present the story that they desperately wanted to reveal to the world. It's gratitude that I, I, I can't paint a picture for you of. The smiles, the laughter, they go, wow, I totally forgot about that. I totally forgot how I felt. And I go, yeah. And there's more. Let's go. Let's go deeper. Let's go find the stuff that you buried because you thought no one wants to hear it. And then we wove it all together and then beautiful stories happen. So when you are sharing your stories, all of you can tell stories that inspire. You already have. All of you have done that. But I'm inviting you to weave and tell stories to not only inspire, but to make someone believe to make someone believe that they're good enough, smart enough, brave enough, whatever it is, when they face that moment of adversity, they go, you know what? Winston told me that story. What did he do? What did he do? He took a breath and, and they stepped through that illusion. They enter into a space that they never believed was possible. And then everything has to change because you've done something that you've never done before. So can you weave stories that have so much richness that when you tell them, that person resonates? Can you weave stories and tell them that are so 
potent that you imprint yourself onto their soul. And at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, all we are are just a bunch of stories that are left behind. So make sure that you leave and weave a few good ones. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching this Plan B workshop. That was Why Do We Only Shoot for the Moon by Winston Young. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Hit the notification bell on the right hand side. Make sure that you get notified when we post new content up. This is a District 96 Plan B workshop presentation and we'll see you next time.